So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today at the Empower Track, uh, part of the Escalator program. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Joe Haverman here from Access to Perspectives, who has a lot of experience with publications and publishing in the open access space um, and generally in open science. And we're really fortunate to hear from her today and learn about things that she can share with us. Just before we start, I'm going to just um, remind you of the code of conduct. Please, in this space, we want to create a welcoming and safe environment where people can ask questions um, and communicate and share their, their experiences. So just be aware of that and please um, act accordingly. If you do have any problems, you're welcome to reach out to myself or to Nomadangelu. So um, just to go back to what we've been doing so far um, since May, we kicked off with an introduction to the research life cycle with <clears throat> Jeroen Bosman and Bianca Kramer from Utrecht University. We looked at uh, tools across the research life cycle and then subsequently in the months following, we've been looking at the different phases um, and tools and practices in the different phases that can help you to enhance your research. And this month we're looking at publishing We'll also have a co-working session later this month on the 22nd of September, where people can come back, ask questions, um, uh, look through some of the content of the presentation again, discuss that, or start working on learning some of the new tools. Um, and that's just a recap of the life cycle, the research life cycle, and where we are today with publication. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jo, um, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anelda, for having me, for inviting me to the session, for the opportunity to engage and, and discuss with, um, yeah, with the participants um, of the program. It looks like a really holistic approach to supporting um, research practices, research management, and yeah, it's a great opportunity to, for me also to be part of. My name is Jo Haberman. As Anna mentioned, I work out of Germany. I have a decade long experience of also working with stakeholders across Africa. I'm co-managing a publishing platform or um, co-founded and uh, managing a, the publishing platform, an open access platform, Africa Archive, which, will, which I will also talk about here today. Um, is a which started as a preprint repository and we come to talk about what preprints are the use and benefits and also limitations would be great to be discussed um, conceptions and misconceptions around preprints that you might have heard of or encountered or um, yeah and also basically honestly and generally they discuss and evaluate all the opportunities that we have for scholarly publishing the tools that are available um, sourcing also uh, immensely from the work by Bianca and Jerome. Um, I also had the pleasure of interviewing them for uh, my podcast, which I can share the link with for you to hear more about a more recent tool that developed for publication strategy, which you will also be introduced in this presentation. So here we, um, what I'd like to discuss and present to you today are innovative workflows and platforms for research dissemination and discovery in Africa, meaning um, publishing services. And there is now, as we are redefining scholarly publishing or enhancing the concept of what is a publication beyond the journal article, um, and we can also discuss how valuable or irritating that discussion is to have or confusing and um, certainly also for, for myself. Um, but it also, I think it provides for a lot of opportunity to bring the knowledge that researchers accumulate and um, yeah, collect throughout their research practices to purpose and to society and um, also within scholarly circles to further evolve what we consider our knowledge system. Um, so basically what I want to enable researchers and scholarly stakeholders at large to consider and, and actually be able to do is to make their research output discoverable, accessible, so that the results can unfold societal, 
societal impact and benefits. I myself come from a basic research um, community. So I studied biology, we were reanalyzing the animal tree of life, evolution and development, where there is not necessarily an immediate benefit for society or the ecosystem or the planet at large um, or environmental reconstruction or reforestation um, application, anything applicable. But um, so it's, it's, it was out of curiosity, understanding um, nature and diversity on the planet. And in so, like some of these aspects eventually will also lead for applicable um, services, applicable knowledge hubs, or you know, find their application across society one way or the other. Um, so yeah, so that's another discussion to have. What's the purpose of research in the first place? But now let's focus on the tools for publishing that we have. And this slide is just also to contextualize it for towards the African um, scholarly ecosystem and beyond. This is just a slide of some of the organizations I've had the pleasure of engaging with over, over the years and continuously so. Um, just to point out that there is many, and these are also not all, obviously, but these are some of the grassroots initiatives and um, institutional um, organizations or more um, established organizations who operate towards open science and um, open access on the continent. So now talking about open access publishing in particular, what does it mean? And oftentimes I hear and observe that some stakeholders and people um, use the term open access synonymously with open science, but open science is basically the overarching concept and approach and philosophy in a way. To me, open science is nothing really new, but rather just, so to say, good scientific practice and the new aspect, which turns out to be quite challenging, but also full um, of opportunities at the same time is that um, is the digital tools through the um, internet and um, globalized internet connectivity of researchers um, in all world regions um, to, to make use of. Um, yeah, and, and to find a way through that. And as you might remember from the 101 Innovations Initiative by Bianca and Jerome, there's a magnitude of digital tools available, some of which we will discuss here under the lens of open access publishing. Uh, or closed access really, but basically, so defining open access, <clears throat> there's different types of open access. And I'm sure you've heard um, of, or you may or may not have heard of the color scheme that exists in the open access community for those advocates towards open access who will make a case of, um, and that's usually also within the interest of the researcher. Of course, we publish to make our, our results accessible to be discussed with other researchers and potentially other societal stakeholders. But what are the means to achieve that? So there are several categories. And here's one categorization approach by color scheme, um, where green open access is self-archiving. So any researcher can put the results on the institutional or personal website, depending on the rights that you have to the results of your own research. Um, and there are other stakeholders involved, like the funders, the institution who provides for the equipment. So there, there are several questions to be clarified before and if you can do that. But normally for, well, we're getting into a lot of details here, but you know, let's focus on the different the difference between these different color schemes of open access. So green means self-archiving either on your own website, on the institutional website, or, and this is what I would highly recommend, using a, a standardized um, established repository, either institutional one or, well, they are all institution not in one way or the other. So they can be at your host institution, at the university where you work, or scholarly institution independent and provided by uh, an independence um, vendor or organization who um, accepts works not only from staff from a certain institution, but from any researcher around the world. And 
These are now known as preprint repositories, one of which is Africa Archive, or we are basically working with several repository systems. Um, and another one you might have heard about is BioArchive, SOC Archive, so they are region as well as um, discipline specific repositories. Uh, we'll get to that in more detail also later. Gold Open Access is what's um, most widely spread currently because it's publisher driven. Um, you will find as you submit your work to a journal under a certain publisher, they may or may not ask you for article processing charges in the hundreds or thousands of brands in your case, um, or dollars or euros, depending on where they are based for you to pay. Um, so basically they, 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 they usually the, the, the previous business model by a publisher was to, for a reader to pay for the access. So that's, that's commonly also known or referred to as the paywall of research articles that are on a publisher's website, but you have to pay to access and to read the article or download and um, print for yourself. But now with Gold Open Access, the publisher makes the work openly accessible on the website for anyone to read. But um, because they lose the pay to read income, they now charge the researchers to pay for the open access and accessible amounts in some cases. But we will also come to learn that there are several databases and organizations where you can search through a variety of journals and select based on a low, lower article processing fee. And there's also plenty and hundreds and thousands, depending on your discipline, or maybe not thousands, but um, several journals that are specific to a research topic, um, which actually do not charge any, any of these APCs, but are otherwise subsidized. The bottom line is, to publishing, there's a certain cost and expense involved, which needs to be covered. The question is, should the researcher have to cover it or the reader, or are there other stakeholders who can find the budget to cover for these costs? Um, and there's this is why we're having these confusing discussions about open access and misconceptions that open access is always expensive. That's not necessarily the case. Actually, that's least often the case. Um, it's just that um, the, the most known and renowned journals, they charge excessive amounts. And this is where everybody's incentivized towards publishing there. And this is where the, the conception um, established itself so tremendously. Um, so diamond or platinum open access is where a journal is subsidized by their host institution or by external funding. So the reader and the author of, an, of a research article or a data set do not have to pay for the processing towards publishing. And then there is hybrid journals um, who offer both models. Um, gold open access and payout, like they have both pay to read and pay to publish as a, as a route. Um, and then what's sometimes referred to as black or unauthorized open access is, for example, SciHub, where there's large scale copying, um, often grounded on moral standards, but factually illegal because contracts exist that prevent that from happening. Um, so I leave the decision to you if you find this acceptable or not. Um, the fact is um, there are certain costs involved. The question is what is a reasonable price tag to cover the cost and also other, other price points. And, and that's another discussion to have which will expand um, way beyond the scope of today's session. Um, so yeah, and then there are concepts like fair and gratis. So gratis open access or liberal open access is, oh, is has evolved from the open source community and um, approach to um, from the tech scene where code and algorithms are being developed for um, websites um, functionalities or um, computerization of some sort. Um, and then the, the products or the code is being basically given to the public domain. So anybody can use it free of charge. Um, 
So gratis and Libra are two different things. So one is um, it's free to use with no costs. And the other one is there are costs involved, basically like a donation by the producer. And the other one has costs involved, but um, okay. So it's, I think I'm, I, I leave it here. So there's two different concepts and I'm actually not quite sure about the difference. Sometimes I am, but I would have to look it up again. Um, the bottom line is that, you know, costs are involved in each step of the workflow for any stakeholders involved. And it has come to a point where the researchers have to, or also libraries, university libraries and other institutional stakeholders have to carry much of the cost and expenditure um, where there might be other opportunities to co-finance um, co and to basically uh, democratize the, the financing scheme. Um, this has led to a dilemma that those institutions who have a lot of resources and a lot of funding can more or less easily afford to pay such services. Some prestigious and wealthy institutions have decided still not to because they find it um, uh, morally um, questionable um, or in individuals at certain institutions. And I just want to bring to attention that now also UNESCO um, is in the middle of a process to what well, they have already published recommendations on open science across the research workflow, as you've also seen um, presented by another and based on the one on one innovations project. Um, but also feeding into the SDGs, the sustainable development goals and um, and here the the mandate and the idea is to make science more accessible, inclusive and equitable for the benefit of all through publishing and also other um, capacity building activities and democratizing and providing equity and equality towards all scholarly stakeholders to achieve that every research institution, every research around the world has um, similar, if not the same opportunities to practice research, to consume research outcomes and to contribute um, so that we can tackle um, and eventually achieve the SDGs. Um, and much of that is based on values and principles, many of which you're probably familiar with because the institution might have similar values and principles systems um, in their policies, um, like equity and fairness, collective benefits, so asking what is this research um, useful for, who benefits, and to what extent, um, what um, transparency, scrutiny, equality of opportunities, sustainability, flexibility are all nice words. And they, yeah, they're just important to keep in mind as we talk about research at large and also eventually um, publishing as we make the research achievements available to a wider audience. Um, so yeah, so here again is another um, diagram that the UNESCO team uh, designed um, showcasing the different components of open science with open science infrastructures, societal engagements, open dialogue with other knowledge systems like also indigenous systems, um, and open sci scientific knowledge where you find publishing as one of them and then the open log indicates also open access um, because that's what basically we want to achieve. Um, and open science and open access does not necessarily mean that, well, for open access, yes. So the idea is to have as much information about a research project openly accessible, for sure the manuscript, so that anybody can benefit from the learnings that the researchers made, but also um, like the underlying data set, some of these might actually be necessary to kept close because they contain sensitive data. And that is also one of the biggest fears as we talk about open access and open science. It doesn't mean that everything has to go online with no proofing, no scrutiny, but it's basically there's also a level of responsibility and assessment of when is um, a research outcome ready to be released to the public to unfold its potentials to cure disease or to inform stakeholders about a certain topic. And now 
so please feel free to also interrupt me at any point when you agree or disagree. I want to um, add to whatever I say here. Um, trying to also when I miss something in the chat, feel free to um, point me towards that. But I'd like to now introduce preprint repositories and just make a statement that they have now in evolved in the past five or so years to be an integral part of the open scholarly publishing workflow. Um, still heavily underutilized, um, quite well embraced by certain research communities like the biosciences, well established in physics and um, IT. I will come to that. And um, there's potential for more usage and more utilization of sharing preprints um, um, along with journal publishing because we know the incentives are real. Um, some of us need to publish in certain journals to advance our careers, um, which doesn't mean that you cannot do both. Um, it's just a matter of awareness how to do both and is it like an, a lot of extra work? And the short answer is no, it's really not. It's, it can be a uh, seamless, um, like uh, just one additional step in the process and everybody actually benefits. So as a bio as an organization which focuses on biosciences, but also looked into preprints and preprint, um, they've built up info hub about preprints and different preprint repositories on their website, which are cross cutting across all disciplines. And their definition is a scientific manuscript that is uploaded by the authors to a public server. And usually that version of the manuscript is also what's deemed ready to be published in a journal by the research team or the individual researcher who, who wrote it. And at that point, um, it's usually already has undergone a level of peer review because um, normally researchers would give it to read and seek feedback from immediate colleagues. And you can, of course, ask if that's not biased. Um, but the whole discussion about the quality of peer review and scrutiny in that activity and how it's being compensated also monetarily or not, well, usually not, um, you know, it's a whole other discussion to have, but also like there is now a norm to label preprints to what they are with a disclaimer that this has this work has not necessarily been um, peer reviewed, meaning it might not have gone underground formal peer review, but as we will also see a few slides down the line, there are now community-based and preprint-based peer review organizations and services available. Um, but these then also indicate, and you can then see commentaries and actual peer review reports, open access, openly accessible, so that not only researchers, but also journalists and policy makers, policy makers can, can basically see what other researchers think about a work presented as a preprint. Um, but we're in the middle of the evolutionary step to establish these as a few um, examples which have um, very promising um, workflows and also easy to implement. And I just um, would like here with also to encourage you to look around these and we will come to see a few examples in the slides forthcoming. Um, yeah, to, to test if this could be something for you to also engage in. So here's what you would find on Wikipedia about the preprint, postprint, published version. So this is usually this cascade, the cascade of versions a manuscript goes through. Um, the preprint is what you can share on, a, on an open repository or on a server. Uh, make sure that they assign DOIs, which then make the manuscript already at this stage citable and also assign um, open licenses. Usually that will be CC BY, as you also see in the bottom left corner of um, my slides, um, which ensures that the, ori the original author should be mentioned by name or the institution who issued the work should be mentioned by name to, um, to acknowledge the, yeah, for acknowledgement and um, appropriate referencing. When submitted to a journal and when it's undergoing peer review and author corrections, 
um, that's then considered as a postprint. So after that has happened, um, but it's not yet layouted by the journal and published. So that then would be the version of record finally published at the journal's website, layouted, formatted, and assigned with a journal DOI. And um, this is by some um, community members and scholarly community members as the published version. But if you consider, in my view, if you consider the word publishing, um, to me, a preprint is also a publication. But this is an ongoing debate and um, yeah, there's no standard in what's considered as published or not. It's just a, a variety of publishing modes and venues, I would say. But yeah, some other people would argue differently. And now to put it in onto a time scale of a different kind, this is from a publication that I was also involved with one of the co-authors. Co um, where we looked into 10 hot topics of open access publishing and um, tried to or elaborated around 10, 10 discussion points that often ha uh, have uh, misconceptions and misunderstandings about certain aspects like, you know, the costs that we just discussed and um, like some many people are fear scooping. But as I just explained, if a DOI is assigned, um, the incentive or the like people would have, like would be legally bound to mention the original author by name. So you can, and you also assign a timestamp to the preprint and this is forever on the internet. So you can always prove that you've established um, priority of discovery. Um, so scooping is actually prevented by sharing a preprint. Okay, so that's the what most people know is the publishing workflow. A scientist writes a manuscript, submits it to a journal, the editors of the journal um, distribute it um, to peer reviewers. And after these give their approval in a couple of weeks or months and sometimes years, um, then eventually the, hopefully the article will be accepted and eventually published and then find its way to the community. And, uh, whatever access form. Um, and now with a preprint workflow, the same stays in place. So you can still publish the, whatever, what some people consider the traditional publishing um, way by our workflow. But at the same time, as you submit to a journal, you might want to consider to share your manuscript also to preprint server for that. Depending on the journal, you might want to, or you should actually check the policy of that journal if they are an approval of, um, of you sharing your work open access and also green open access. But most journals nowadays do, for sure, the big publishers have an open access policy. Um, not all journals within, but um, like 80, like more than 80% of the journals on our planet. Um, actually encourage you to share a preprint because it allows also their editors and their reviewers to assess these public commenting that's then possible through the sharing of the preprint and consider it for the decision-making and curation decisions if the manuscript fits into their scope. Um, so everybody wins really. And then you can already at this point share your work with the funders, with other stakeholders, with colleagues, um, for in-depth discussion on your work. And you don't have to wait for the next conference to do that. Um, and you can you know, divert other projects from it as the reviewers do the work that, and uh, in the time that they need. And you might also then have an opportunity to, to um, rework a manuscript based on the comments that you receive and then resubmit an improved version. And that's also an interest again of the publisher. You can signal to them, we got valuable feedback to our preprint, can we resubmit? And then if they have um, a good connection or basically if they're in a short um, line of communication with the reviewers, then those people would certainly also um, appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, just a few kind of points to consider um, and the differences or how the two workflows 
complement each other. Um, so yeah, so here's an example of Zenodo as one of the most or the better known um, repository systems. Zenodo accepts not only um, written manuscripts, but also data sets, images, movies, um, depending on your discipline, you might create a whole portfolio of different formats of research output, all of which can be archived and stored and made citable through Zenodo. You see that there's also a different, um, a variety of access rights, open access, closed access. So there you actually only see, as you would in a paper journal, you see the title, the authors, and the, the abstract of the work. Um, and the closed access might all also have reasons. Um, so yeah, and then there's restricted access um, where some of the data is being disclosed and others not and embargo. So you can also put a timeline onto your sub sub Zenodo submission and indicate um, the funder says we should keep it disclosed uh, or uh, closed until, I don't know, March next year. And after that, Zenodo will make the work open access. Um, so yeah, um, and then just another example of how established and like the, the lifetime of a preprint repository like archive.org has been around since um, 1991. So it's really not a new um, invention to talk about preprint repositories. Archive covers a whole range of um, disciplines also. And now we have a whole lot of discipline and region specific preprint repositories or, and many of these also go beyond the manuscript and accept data sets as well as other formats, um, including BioArchive, MedArchive um, has now um, also a vast amount of, of um, research output on their platform, thanks to or due to the pandemic and the information sharing agri-archive for agricultural research, soccer archive for social sciences. There used to be the Arabic Science Archive, for Arabic speaking or research on, um, on the MENA region um, topics that has unfortunately ceased operation. But you see, there is this is another way of curating research um, outcomes and making it accessible to the respective communities and also trying to get yeah, to curate the content to make it accessible and searchable in an efficient way. Um, yeah, and again, coming back to as a bio, here's an overview, or this is the link to the preprint service list. And you will see where well, they have 10 pages. I, I can't recall. I think we're in the 40s or 50s of different preprint service um, where you can consider submitting your work. And then there's also another initiative called We Three Data, which is a re repository for data. Yeah, research data repositories, which um, where Zenodo is also listed and others. Um, so the re re3 data lists other repositories that as well accept data sets. Okay, summarizing um, to um, just to conclude about preprints are an opportunity for early dissemination of research results before formal publication or in line um, alongside formal publication in academic journals. We can do both build your reputation by showcasing your achievements early on and also um, complying with institutional policies and publishing in certain journals and thereby also making a work accessible in a curated manner because that's also the value I think journals can provide for the research communities to curate certain contents and topics in a meaningful way. Um, establish priority of discovery, allow for feedback on the manuscript by the wider research community, facilitate open science practices at large. So it's basically a, a key component of open science in general, and um, is a good way for reputation building, especially for, and not exclusively for early career researchers. Oh yeah, here's the re three. Um, data um, registry, uh, where you see that, um, so 
wait, sorry. Okay, so on the reef3data.org website, um, you can browse by country and you see that um, in Africa, well, South Africa is, is green, but there are still quite a few blue spots in countries um, where there are non, no listed data repositories, which doesn't mean that they don't exist. They don't, they just don't comply with um, what is commonly referred to as Western standards or standardized um, archiving practices that would be compliant for an international community to make use of. So some of these countries probably and most certainly have their own institutional or national archives. Um, and the list or the, this map will probably turn green as soon as um, there is enough collaboration and engagement and um, improved interoperability of different digital systems or digitizing non-digital systems in the, um, to start with in some cases to yeah to turn the the map green fully but you can go in on the website on on a particular country for example south africa and then see all the data repositories that are listed on this re registry for south africa and you can also search by your the research topics that you're engaged in and working on and here is um, just an example searching for just the term or Africa as a term. There are 42 repositories that have the term Africa as part of their name or are actually hosted and located on the continent, and most of which are in South Africa. Okay, so um, here's again um, work that was done by Jerome and Bianca, whom we've met in the first session. And um, again, like I, yeah, on, on my website, you find the link to, to the podcast if you want to hear about this decision-making tool, um, about making a decision about how and where to publish your work. So it all starts with the purpose questions. Why do we want to publicize our research findings? And it's become really dark here because the weather has changed. We're in the middle of a, well, shortly before the thunderstorm, heavy rain here. Thankfully, after weeks and months of drought, which we're not used to in Europe. So the questions you, you might ask, why do we want to disseminate the work is, for example, establish priority of our findings. And that's when you want to go the preprint route because the traditional journal publishing route might just take too long. Um, or, you want to invite comments and feedback and scrutiny. Same, like find a way to quickly publicize. And this can also be in an email list of trusted researchers. It doesn't have to, be, you know, there's, there's several options that you have if you're uncertain about putting your work on a preprint server because you might consider publishing with a journal who might not um, support um, might not accept your work. There's very few, but those still exist. Um, journals that would see preprint dissemination as a form of redundancy and then argue, why should we publish your work if it's already out there? But like, as I've said before, there's many benefits that come also towards the publisher in doing so. It's just also in that case, in those cases, a level of awareness of these benefits. and that that's also helping transparency and um, collaboration um, amongst researchers, which we all also journals want to serve for or made, had a mandate to serve for. Um, we want to archive the evidence, so that's not necessarily for courts, does not necessarily call for open access. Um, so basically what, so this is basically uh, an active Excel sheet. So depending on, you can actually click through if you go to not my website, but uh, the Google spreadsheet that where this is published. Um, then you can take these boxes manually yourself um, and then find suggestions of tick boxes in the subsequent sections or what are you publishing, when, how, and where. And you can change any of these ticks, tick, ticked boxes. So you can untick and tick others that are not ticked. 
and thereby so basically um but this then gives you a hint of where you should publish your work um or oh, you know what's recommended what's a recommended venue for you to disseminate your work for the wider or not so wide community to to review um other so basically talking about the journal selection strategy now that we've um develop priority of or establish priority of discovery or not um, but when it comes to making an informed selection for a journal there's also um, first of all but here in point number three the website think check submit um, to go going through a checklist of what like knowing about a journal like what factors do you might consider if they not only comply with the scope of your research and vice versa, so you would stand, of course, a higher chance of getting accepted if the scope of the journal meets the scope of your research. That's like the no brainer normally. It's the first um, necessity to comply with. But also, what do they charge? Um, are they an established journal? Do they actually provide for rigorous peer review? Do they have statements on the website about um, what the peer review process looks like and how long it usually takes for them to inform you about when you might get a response about acceptance or rejections or anything else um, that might be of your interest? Um, so basically, um, these are the several more um, things to consider that you can check also on the journal's website. Um, also, if you're concerned about predatory publishing, there's also ways to identify predatory journals, whatever you consider a predatory journal is, and this is an, also an unfinished discussion to have. But um, if the journal has a physical address with um, the team or the editors presented by name and possibly also with a picture, but not necessarily so, um, if the journals are listed in indexing services, like, for example, the Director of Open Access Journals, Doach, which exclusively lists open access journals, and there's way more than you probably consider or, or think. Um, and then there's also other indexing systems like Dimensions and the Lens, and all of these journals have undergone a certain level of scrutiny testing. Um, so therefore are uh, good journals or considered good and not predatory. Um, the other question which some of us um, deem as a form of predatory, predatory is the excessive cost, but that's again, another discussion to have. Um, so yeah, referring, so if you want to make an, decision of yes we want to only publish in a, in an open access journal and Doge also lists gold open access so um, but not any form of closed um, journals it might also list hybrid journals but you will on this registry find journals that provide for open access publishing and you also get a preview of the usual costs that they charge for you to submit, if any. So many of these open access journals also don't incur any costs for you. So these are basically the two reference points for you to consider and to search for a journal for you to publish in after you have to, um, defined and set the scope of your research, which might also divert what you publish, might also exceed your original research topic or be a very specific niche in, in a broader research topic. And therefore you might search for a less or more specific journal to publish in or topic specific. Okay, so now um, coming to the question of peer review, um, we know and are well, um, uh, well, what is it, familiar with, with the, journal-based peer review as, as we normally encounter as researchers submitting to a journal. Um, but there is, as I mentioned before, a bunch of services that are journal and publisher independent. And to mention by name just four, 
and let me know maybe in the chat if you've heard of one or the other before. Um, so there's pre-review, which is exclusively working on preprints and then enabling and facilitating peer review activities and also established guidelines um, for peer review on preprints and making those preprint-based peer review reports um, accessible by also publishing these. And this is another trend that's also emerging to, to so that the activity of writing a review, which oftentimes takes a whole day, if not two of your work, and also a whole lot of knowledge and expertise goes in to give an informed feedback um, to the authors. Um, but you can now publish also the peer review report. You could have also always done that, but now there's also institutional backing to do so um, by such communities and some of the research institutions are embracing that increasingly so that you can cite your own peer review reports. And you might have seen Pablons before, which has been on the market for quite a few years now, who um, have a star ranking and you can then also showcase your peer review activities, but not necessarily making their reviews um, openly accessible, the reports, which there might also be good reason not to. So you know, I'm not saying that um, publishing a peer review is a must do on all circumstances, but you might want to consider, um, consider publishing also for your own reputation building, but there might be cases where you might decide against it. Um, and again, on the on the SR Bio website, a more recent initiative also um, featured not only these four that I just showed you in the previous slide, but many other review communities and initiatives, um, each of which are either discipline specific or focus on the life sciences or other disciplines, and um, others. Um, I'm more, more for a broader general scholarly community. And yeah, all of them just play with and innovate around peer review standards, peer review workflows, um, preprint based, journal based, and, and just trying to make the peer review activities worthwhile for the researchers involved so that they can also gain reputation and gain benefits from doing that and thereby also serving um, the scholarly community in and not by directly conducting research but informing colleagues about and giving feedback in a standardized form um, so yeah here's just an announcement from a couple of weeks and months ago by as a bio you can also um, go back to their website and um, read some statements and why this is useful and how it can be done and what organizations have already embraced and backed and supported this activity um okay so coming back to the african continent um here are like for open access, there's various stakeholders and organizations, and this is also not meant to be an exhaustive list. Um, there are continent-wide and regional organizations and institutions who work uh, and build capacity towards open access. Um, regarding peer review, I myself and colleagues um, work together with um, TCC Africa and Ada Africa as well as eLife and pre-review to um, for a train of trainers of peer reviewers um, for peer reviewers um, to contextualize the peer review process into the African region and talk about the biases that African scholars often face. Um, you probably experienced some of these yourself and how open peer review or more open peer review approaches can help to overcome those biases and barriers. Um, then there's just other aspects of open science mentioning um, there's open source, open code, open data. And here each slide also shows explicitly the African stakeholders therein. Um, often you also obviously have South African 
um, organizations being involved. Open hardware is an important topic, especially, but not exclusively in the life sciences. Um, open science and indigenous knowledge systems. There are um, various uh, concepts, principles, guidelines, also how to, as a researcher, how to work with indigenous communities and how indigenous knowledge can also complement and inform scholarly knowledge. Um, and, you know, mentioning here the care principles, which perfectly complement the FAIR principles, which will be a discussion you probably also have already had or will have in the future in the series of trainings um, around data management. So I'm just quickly skipping through just so that you, and you will have access to the slides, obviously, so that you have seen the breadth of and the number of stakeholders on the continent. Um, for each aspect of open science. And here's for our society engagement, African literacy science network, global network under the microscope are working towards science literacy and citizen engagement with research. And here are some of the stakeholders for infrastructure towards open science and open access um, dissemination. Um, and finally, I just want to spend a couple of words um, on and really keep this short for less than five minutes, if you allow, to Africa Archive, just because it, um, um, yeah, it's, it's basically meant to open the doors or to, to build capacity and inform about what I basically just presented to you. And we are on a mission to establish an independent and open research repository that serves the whole continent for that we're um, continuously looking um, for partner institutions who can provide primary service space for us to then um, you know, establish open source uh, software for a repository system that's then cross-disciplinary. In the meantime, we work with established these systems, one of which is the Nodo that I showed you. Others are FigShare, um, OSF, the Open Science Framework, um, Chaos, PubHub, and I always miss one. I think they will come. And the purpose of us doing that is to once um, overcome the language barriers between Francophone, Lusophone, Anglophone, um, but also opening scholarly uh, archiving systems towards um, traditional African languages or regional African languages. Um, we want to increase the visibility of African scholarly output internationally and also across the continent for, to, for researchers um, amongst, um, yeah, uh, across the continent. Uh, yeah, and integrate um, African researchers interna into international consortia and enabling them to be active stakeholders. Um, and thereby also increase opportunities for funding. So these are the six now of Science Open, I think I didn't mention um, previously. These are the six systems and organizations we work with. Some are for profit, others non profit. Um, for us, this is just a legal um, term or a legal kind of, um, yeah. Like for us, it's more important how open the system is per se, how functional it is and efficient in allowing us and the researchers to establish um, what we are on a mission for, to establish um, discoverability by submitting through us. Um, like I said, or through Africa Archive, um, we work with, with each of these systems is established in a standardized ecosystem with assignment of DOIs. You can log in with your ORCID ID um, there's various organizations involved um, also assigning raw identifiers, meaning institutional identifiers, so that institutions can also work towards reputation building and visibility. The UIs are assigned um, through Crossref and Datasite, um, like one or the other. And eventually, like we thereby also have, or we also have activities in place where we can now measure the actual research output from and across Africa. Um, not only through what comes in as submissions through Africa Archive, and which we can then nicely compartmentalize 
on the other on the existing systems. But we've also had a mapping exercise where we dig into ex accessible data to map the institutional repositories across the continent, which might not yet be picked up by the standardized digital systems and databases. Um, so yeah, so there are benefits for any stakeholders, librarians, researchers, and publishers alike in working with us. Um, again, and um, various partners. We work with an interesting um, project with which we work on also with three mostly South African, but operating across the continent organization, Science Link, SD Communications, and Masakana. We currently are in the process of translating 180 English research articles by African authors um, and scholars into the listed six languages. Um, and that's quite an exciting and demanding project to work on, serving multilingualism and also enhancing African languages um, to, yeah, to be utilized in the scholarly ecosystem. Okay, and this is the mapping um, slide where here is an example from Nigeria. The, um, we have a network and you find this on our website. You can also search for South Africa and, or I can, I can share the link with you for South Africa where you then find the institutions and the repositories at the institutions who host South African scholarly, in this case, Nigerian scholarly literature and data, um, which might not be easily accessible through Web of Science, Scopus, or other digital search algorithms and systems, but just showcasing what is available already. And many of these are open access. They might not just be archived in a standardized way to be discoverable easily. Um, so here are the countries that we have received submissions from and across um, all disciplines really, mostly from social sciences, but also medicine, education, health and physics. And you are most welcome to reach out um, to us to talk about uh, anything publishing related. Okay, so let me unshare the screen and happy to reshare one or the other slide for the discussion. I hope I didn't lose anyone <laughs> and because it's been quite a bit of um, information I'm, I'm aware and I'm very much in the topic. So I probably jumped through some of the subjects too quickly, but feel free to ask anything and, um, and we can revisit any aspect that I mentioned. Thank you, Joe. That was an amazing presentation with so much information and so much um, really contemporary um, information about things that people are thinking about, people are struggling with, people are maybe not aware of. So thank you very, very much. I think we can really unpack this presentation and, and talk through so many issues here, starting from open access to um, uh, as Marissa was pointing out, um, the preprint situation, what universities understand under preprints, how they allow or discourage it, why they do that, um, moving on to um, all the other topics that you covered. So thank you very, very much. This is a really, really good talk.